Commissioner Chen will not be attending today's meeting, and Commissioner Law will be joining us at a later time. President Camargo? Here. Commissioner Avanesian? Here. Commissioner Hale? Here. Very good. Uh, next item, please. Number two, the approval of the November 7, 2016 meeting minutes. Okay, uh, fellow commissioners, anybody have uh, any changes, comments on the meeting minutes? No, I don't have any comments. And, and I have none. Uh, so we can accept them as is. Three, GWP commission staff comments. Staff, any comments? No, sir. Chair? I don't have in anything. Commissioners, any opening comments? Uh, I don't have any comment, but I have a question about this fraud calls that uh, I heard uh, there were some fraud calls to people from uh, supposedly from Glenel Water and Power. Yes. So this is something that, that goes on from time to time. It's not anything new. There just seems to be these, these periods, unfortunately, around holidays. And you'll see it happen. It's not just us. LADWP has just recently put out a whole um, uh, array of different notifications. We've had a few of these incidents that have been reported to us. Uh, and if you watch our website, we'll probably, in most cases, year-round, keep a notice of some sort on there just to say, if you get a call, you know, it isn't us. If somebody comes and knocks on your door regarding payment, it isn't us. You know, we don't, we don't demand payment over the phone or take payment over the phone. We don't come to your house. We don't go in your house. Um, you know, there's very few times when we go to your house that we'll even enter your property, and usually those are specifically to look at our equipment. So anytime you have somebody that's telling you these things, that's asking you for payment over the phone, that's telling you you're going to be disconnected, do refuse. Do not, do not uh, give in. Uh, hang up the phone immediately and call us just as a verification, because we like to know when it happens, because we'll report that to the, to the Glendale Police Department as well. Uh, and then we can fill you in on, on your account, and you'll be fine. You, you know, your notices from us will, become, will come in writing. It'll be very specific. So please, if you get any of these kind of calls, uh, do not respond. Uh, hang up and call us immediately. Thank you for the explanation. Very good. Thank you. Uh, so that closes number three. Uh, <clears throat> next item. Four reports. Okay, very good. So before we dive into the agenda, uh, at the suggestion of uh, Mr. Zern, wanted to move item uh, D, the Aliso Canyon update, up to A, if that's, uh, if that's acceptable to the group. Uh, and in that way, we would hear from um, Marisol Espinosa from Southern California Gas Company first. Good afternoon, President Camargo and uh, Glender Water and Power Commissioners. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today to provide an update on the Aliso Canyon facility and where SoCal Gas is in terms of well inspections and doing what we can to get working towards getting the field back online. Um, just a little bit of, actually, let me go back. I want to give a little bit of background. Um, as you may be aware, the field is um, 86 billion cubic feet of usable capacity. Um, I think I'm having a little bit slow. <coughs> oh. Go. I'm going backwards. Okay. The field is 86 billion cubic feet of usable capacity. Currently, uh, this field has 15 billion cubic feet of gas. Um, SoCal Gas's total storage capacity is 135 billion cubic feet, and Aliso Canyon accounts for 86 billion cubic feet of our total capacity. This is about 64% of our total capacity, making this facility critically important for our operations. It currently serves 17 um, electric generation plants in the LA Basin, and 61% um, of electric generation is fueled by natural gas. And we just, we're here to talk about sort of the critical nature of the field um, in ensuring energy reliability through the summer and winter. As you know, uh, in February, on February 18th, 
earlier this year in 2016, the uh, methane leak at Aliso Canyon was sealed and certified by the Division of um, Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Resources as being sealed. That is nearly 10 months ago uh, that that was certified as, as being sealed. And since January of 2016, um, we have not had any withdrawal or injections at the, at the field. Um, currently, storage at Aliso Canyon is about 20% of our total capacity. So there has been concern about whether we would have enough gas to provide to customers uh, during the summertime, um, which we were able to make it through the summer due to conservation efforts um, from all of our local utilities, um, including Glendale Water and Power, and a lot of coordination that took place amongst um, SoCal Gas and the energy providers in the region. And since the leak was sealed, we, were, we have also been working in compliance with newly issued regulations from um, Dogger and the CPUC in order to ensure that we can safely resume operations at Aliso Canyon and also to ensure that we can provide service, um, gas service to customers. So this diagram is uh, sort of a picture of the well inspection process um, that we have been uh, going through since uh, the leak was sealed in February. Uh, there are a total of 114 wells. Um, there were 115. Um, SS25, which was the leaking well, has been abandoned and taken out of service completely. Uh, and there is currently a root cause analysis that is taking place in cooperation with the CPUC and Dogger and a third party to determine what caused the leak. And, and uh, we are still, we're, we're awaiting for that study to be completed. Uh, it's still estimated that it will be completed sometime in the first half of 2017. And so where we are is of the 114 wells, they are, there is a two-phase process for inspection. Um, phase one is a uh, noise and temperature test where a thermometer and a um, a thermometer and a microphone are inserted down into the tubing of the well and to in order to detect any anomalies or drops in temperature or noise variations that can tell us that there is a leak or any sort of um, compromise to the tubing in within the well. Once a well has moved forward from phase one, it will go to phase two, which is a series of six um, additional tests. And those are um, tests that are look, they look at imaging, uh, the bonding of the cement, as well as um, hydrostatic pressure. So these are six additional tests to just um, ensure the integrity of each well. So as of, as of, um, the time that this presentation was completed, I believe this, I believe it's now 31, but uh, it looks like 30 wells are Dogger approved um, and certified. Um, 83 wells are currently in phase two, going through those additional six tests. And um, one well has been plugged and abandoned. Um, there are currently eight wells that are going through diagnostic testing, and basically what happens is as we prioritize uh, wells that are, that are being inspected, it is about we have to put a workover rig on each, uh, on each well, so we try to put, you know, it's, it's really about how much equipment we have available and whether we have the right number of rigs to um, conduct the testing. So we, we do remove the tubing and uh, put the... Uh, you know, put the instruments, uh, drop them down the well so that we can um, conduct that testing. Uh, excuse me, can you explain what is Dogger? Oh, yes. Dogger is the Division of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Resources. So they are the state agency that regulates um, the wells um, in our storage field. Thank you. Okay. So some additional, um, some additional enhancements that we have um, put in place at uh, Aliso Canyon, um, if we strengthen some of our, our infrastructure, um, all the inner metal tubing of every well that has been approved um, as certified has been uh, replaced, all of the inner tubing, as well as um, withdrawal and injection will now only be taking place through that inner metal tubing. Um, we've also implemented a new storage risk management plan. Um, in addition, 
we have installed a new fence line monitoring system, um, which is eight, there are eight uh, sensors um, at the perimeter of the facility that will be, uh, that will be um, monitoring, you know, if there's any release of gas or if there is any leak, it will be detecting. We also have staff that will be monitoring uh, those operations 24-7. Um, we're also doing twice daily patrols of every well. Uh, and in addition, we're really working hard to communicate um, with our stakeholders um, throughout the, the Porter Ranch and surrounding areas. So we've created a new Aliso Canyon Community Advisory Council. We have also implemented an air quality notification system. And we're continue to ed continuing to educate our stakeholder groups um, about the happenings and what is going on at the facility. Before you leave that slide, yes, Ms. Espinosa, yes. can you talk further about the new uh, risk management plan that you've implemented? Yes. Um, so this storage risk management plan, it is um, includes well data management systems and a continuous process of, of validating and evaluating the integrity of our wells with ongoing safety and risk assessments. So we're working with Dogger uh, to... Um, implement that system. So, very good. Uh, in addition, um, I think what is uh, what you know. What I really am here to talk about are the next steps, and these next steps actually are in line with SB 380, which was Fran Pavley's bill, um, which issued a moratorium on injections at the facility until the wells at Aliso Canyon could be deemed safe and the facility could be um, able to operate. So as of November 1st, we did request authorization to resume injections at Aliso Canyon. And that was with the 30 wells that have, or I think at that time it was 29 uh, wells that have that have been uh, certified by Dogger, and they are currently reviewing the data. They are um, reviewing what we have submitted. Once they have done that, they will be holding a community meeting in the San Fernando Valley, uh, somewhere in, in the area, and they have to uh, provide 15 days of notice to the community, and upon holding that hearing, they will um, make a decision as to whether to certify with the CPUC whether we can resume injections. And that is where we are at the moment. Um, the other thing, I, we do have some videos. Um, I won't show them today, but they are, um, I think, a really good resource of information for customers and for anybody that has questions about the well inspection process and details or, um, you know, the well seal and isolation process or some of the infrastructure and enhancements that we've conducted at the facility. Those are really great resources, and they can be found at SoCalGas.com uh, forward slash Aliso Updates. And the other thing I did also want to talk about was uh, the winter, um, as we, you know, have prepared for the winter, uh, the recent, recently SoCal Gas did uh, implement or launch a SoCal Gas Advisory, which is a voluntary call for customers to conserve gas during times where there may be higher demand. Uh, customers can sign up for uh, email or text updates and to, in order to be able to uh, conserve conserve gas, so that's one of the things that we are looking to just uh, you know asking customers to be mindful of usage as we are in a critical time where we don't have the amount of gas that we've had at the time at at, at this time um, usually during the winter time. Uh, so with that, that's my update. I just wanted to open it up for questions. See if okay. there's any. Thank you very much. Questions. Uh, you said still uh, you don't know what is the cause of it. We do, we are still there is still an investigation that's taking place. So once that report is finalized by uh, it's it's a third party and in conjunction with the CPUC and Dogger, and then we are providing the um, you know we're we're providing the agencies full access to the site to the well site, and uh, we will know soon hopefully so, so uh, how can you stop something if you don't know the, what is the cause of it yeah and that I think that is ultimately we would like to know the root cause of, of it but what we're trying to do is we have been 
working to conduct all of the testing to make sure that the wells that are in operation at the facility are you know, of good integrity and that they've passed the tests and inspections that they have been going through. Have you identified that, uh, so you have one well that's been, that's been plugged. Uh, is that the well that you anticipate was the, that caused the leak? So that is actually, I, that is a set, that is a different well because um, I, I did double check on that today. I don't know what the reasoning behind that particular well, why that was abandoned, but I would have to, I could get back to you on that. Okay. Um, question? Yeah. Um, so I, just to put a finer point on what Haran was saying, um, you want to re-inject into, this, into the, the, uh, the storage facility and pressurize it again, right, mm -hmm. with the 30 wells that are active. So if any of the other wells that are still under inspection are, are problematic, um, it's all one system. They're all connected to the same kind of cavern underground, right, as well, I understand it. They are. Um, the one thing I will mention is any well that has not been, if it, if it, 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 it is isolate any well that we have found that has not passed phase one. Um, so th there are wells that are that are isolated from the, that are, they're being isolated from the system or from the reservoir. So I think in so in in, in the graphic it says. Let me go back. So the set, there are 75 wells that have been mechanically sealed and isolated. And so what they are, when they're isolated, is they are, they are plugged and they are filled with fluid so that they are um, isolated from the rest of the reservoir. So that's... Okay. So I, I have a, a second line of questioning. I don't know if anybody else wants to talk about the, the well site itself, but I, I wanted to talk about the kind of the economics of gas market if so um, it's pretty clear that it's the gas company that is is I, I know that the word using the word fault is is has legal implications so I don't want to go there but but it the, it was the gas company's well it was a mistake that the gas company kind of owns and my concern is that we get into a period where we have shortages and uh, GWP ratepayers are being asked to pay for higher gas prices to run our generating stations, how can the, our ratepayers be assured that the risk elements of the future of those gas prices is borne not only by the ratepayers of GWP, but by shareholders of SoCal Gas and other stakeholders who were responsible for making sure that these wells were safe and that the storage facility could continue to operate? I think that, I mean, one of the things that we have said is um, in regards to rates is that the the rate payers, well, our, I know for our rate payers, we did not want them to bear the responsibility of um, the Aliso Canyon leak and so incident. So, you know, a lot of the the costs that were so that have been associated with Aliso Canyon are being covered by our insurance. So, um, I mean, I can I can tell you that I know it's, we have a one billion dollar insurance policy, and currently it's about I think the costs of Aliso Canyon have been about seven hundred uh, million. We don't want we actually don't want you know. I think that's why we want the facility to get back online is because we want to ensure that we can continue to get gas at a lower cost, at a lower rate, so that we don't have to, you know, I don't, so that we don't have to I, charge I the understand. customer but, but, higher price. But there, these, these two things, these two concepts are not, in, they're inextricably linked, right? You mm -hmm. have to have the, the facility operating safely. Mm -hmm. And if it cannot operate safely, then there may be rate implications. And I guess my point is, if the facility cannot operate safely, who bears that risk now? Because it's not our facility. Glendale Water and Power ratepayers are not responsible for the, the problem that occurred there. Um, and I just don't know... I don't know how you fairly allocate that risk. Um, you know, it also seems to me that you know, if if the gas company were 
going to be particularly Machiavellian about this. They could say, well, we need our storage facility, so you better let us open it back up. Otherwise, the rates go sky high. And I guess, I, you know, I, I don't have a lot of faith right now in the regulatory environment because it led to this. So how, how are we all working together to make sure that that risk is allocated to where the parties responsible for the problem are? And I, I wish I could answer the question, but I don't, unfortunately, have an answer to the question. If I could, I mean, I'm happy. No, to, I appreciate. I'm that. happy That's to bring. I'm happy to bring it back to, you know, powers that be. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, one other question for you, if I may. So, SB 380. Um, did that envision that you could uh, do what you're planning to do now? That is, um, go through and, and do the two phase testing on some subset of, of wells, and then and then start to bring those line those online. Um, or was it was it envision that you would do all of the inspections and and um, uh, and then open every well that's been deemed to be safe? So my my understanding initially was that base any well that was not that had not passed the eight um, test testing process, if it was it would be taken out of service or isolated from the field before we could before we could continue operations. So basically, the, the rules were um, laid out by Dogger, and every well that was inspected would make it through, if it, if it did not make it through the eight protest process, then it would be uh, isolated from the, from the reservoir and taken out of service temporarily until it could be fully tested. And then we could, but we could, we could continue operate. We could t resume injection at that point. So if it hasn't gone through the process, then it would be taken out of service. Okay. Uh, other questions? Thank you so much for coming to speak to us. I apologize for missing the very beginning of your remarks. So um, if you've already touched on this, uh, I'm sorry if you're repeating yourself. Um, there are 114 total wells. And are those wells the original wells that were dug in order to extract oil? Is that why there are that number and in the locations where they're located? There are, some of them are original, so they are converted oil wells. Um, we took over the field in 1972. Uh, and so some of them are original. I don't have the exact number of which ones are original and which ones were um, later drilled, uh, so I'd have to get back to you on the exact number, but they, some of them are original wells. Okay. Okay. If there are no further questions, uh, thank you, Ms. Espinosa. I appreciate your update. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Uh, 4B, water conservation update. President Camargo, members of the commission, my name's uh, Michael DeGhetto, Chief Assistant General Manager for Water at Glendale Water and Power. And I'm going to give my uh, monthly water conservation update. Since May of 2015, our customers have saved 2.9 billion gallons of water. Um, in May of 2013, you know what, I'm sorry about that, in May of 2015, two, two days a week watering was implemented. And our summer monthly conservation was between 24 and 27 percent. And then in July of 2016, we went to three days a week watering. Um, and our conservation numbers stayed between 18 and 21 percent. And then my graph shows uh, those variations. So there's definitely been some conservation that's um, stayed because we stayed in the three days a week and also because uh, people have changed some of their watering habits. Uh, last month, uh, Commissioner Law asked about um, the efficiency of the newer apartment buildings, basically. Um, so, I, so I went ahead and I looked at how many dwelling units have been installed and what our usage has been over that time period. So the number of dwelling units, and when I talk about a dwelling unit, you know, for me, that's, uh, it could be a single family home or it could be an apartment, like an individual apartment. So maybe if it was an apartment building with uh, 10 apartments, those would be 10 dwelling units. So 
between 2012 and 2016, um, the number of units has increased by about 1,300. So it's about a 1.9% increase. And our usage has decreased 17% over that same period. That's, um, that's overall you're saying, not, um, not per dwelling? Not per dwelling, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna dive into that a little bit in more detail as I go through. Uh, so if we look at 2012, we started with uh, 67,838 units and then uh, we've got 69,000 total units uh, there in 2016. And single family and residential went up about a little less than 100. And then, so most of it's been in the multifamily. And I, I went and I printed uh, monthly usage in HCF by customer type. And this graph has, has a lot of information on it. So the orange lines is single family residential use. And when you, when you look at the months, those peaks are in the summer months. So in 12, 13, and 14, single family residential use was well above 400,000 HCFs in a month total. But on the green line, the green line's the multifamily residential use. And on that green line, there, there's higher usage in summer as well. And again, that's for outdoor irrigation. Um, but you can tell the green line, to some extent, has gone down over time, even in, the, in these later years. And the lowest level in 2015 was when we had two days a week watering, you know, when we were in those really restrictive conservation. Um, the, the dark blue line's commercial. And then down below, we've got uh, municipal and just irrigation accounts. And then the, that line that says other um, kind of drops to zero. When we first implemented the AMI, I think there were some accounts that weren't assigned in the right accounts, and that's why that dropped to zero. So over about that first two years of getting the AMI system, those other accounts got assigned to where they go. I, I think the other thing to note on here is during winter months, single family residential use drops pretty far below multifamily. And, and when you look back at that, at that other graph, right, there's 22,000 units of single family, and there's 46,000, 47,000 of multifamily. Again, in the winter, there isn't the outdoor irrigation is really why that drops so much. Uh, so if we look at the use per unit, uh, so the peak in 2012 for multifamily, and that's the MFR's multifamily residential, was uh, 350,000 HCFs for, for one month. And the peak in 2016, and the reason I used 2016, I didn't think it was fair to compare to 2015 because we were in such restrictive um, usage. It was... Uh, 341,000. So the peak monthly use per multifamily unit went down from 7.6 per unit in 2012 to 7.3 per unit in 2016. So it's like a 4% drop in use, which to me shows that those newer units are much more efficient uh, than they used to be because we added more units, yet the total usage went down. Um, similarly, for single family, you know, the peak. Single family use um, in, in 2012 was 460,000 HCFs. And the peak single family use in 2016 was 378,000 HCFs. So the peak monthly use for single family units went down from 20.7 HCF per unit to 17 HCFs per unit. So that's almost like 18% drop. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm looking at those peaks just comparing to the number of units at those at those year in those years. I'm sorry. Tell what is HCF again? It's a hundred cubic feet, so it's seven hundred and forty-eight okay. gallons. And actually, hundred and forty-eight gallons. Seven hundred and forty-eight gallons. Seven hundred and forty-eight gallons. Okay. It's how we Got bill. Okay. So um, <laughs> that's a good segue to my next slide. So it's there's seven hundred and forty-eight gallons per HCF. 
So when you look on your bill, maybe you have uh, 13 units or 26 billing units, it might be called, those are the HCFs. So if you calculate that out, and I, and I think a lot of people, well, I mean, a lot of people don't. Um, I, I do, but so if, if you're using in a multifamily a peak of 7.3 HP, HCF per unit per month, that's 5,400 gallons a month for multifamily unit. But on a single family unit, if we're using that peak of 17 HCF per unit per month, it's 12,000, almost 13,000 gallons a month. So each, so what that means is if you take all the houses, all the single family homes in Glendale, and you average it out for in the, in the peak in the summer, it's 17 HCFs. So they're each using almost 13,000 gallons a month. And, and I think it might be surprising because if you look at our tier one rates, they're $2.45 in HCF, which is 0.32 cents a gallon. So it's not 32 cents a gallon, it's 0.32 cents per gallon, which is 0.0032 dollars per gallon is what we're charging to treat to take water from Colorado or from the Bay Delta, treat it, deliver it, pump it to your tap 24 seven, whenever you turn it on. And then just, um, if you look at the tier two rates, it goes from 0.32 to 0.40 cents per gallon. And I think that's one reason um, customers might get surprised when we talk about how many gallons you used in a month. You might say, there's no way I use 12,000 gallons. My bill is only, you know, whatever that comes out to, uh, 17 times 245, uh, like 35 bucks. So, and just one, one reason we use the HCFs, I mean, r really the reason is because it's kind of difficult or it would be a funny thing to say, 0 0.0032 dollars per gallon is what we're we charging you, right? That's... That's why we use that unit of HCF. It makes it whole numbers. Now then looking at that uh, use per day, is you could look in the winter to kind of come up with a good idea of indoor use, basically. Um, and I just, I picked one there in 2014, it's like 15,000 uh, HCFs. And I included single and multifamily. So if you use a low winter day as a good approximation, um, it's 15,400 HCS, which is 11.5 million gallons. Um, and the population served that we use when we do our state water board reporting is 193,300. Um, part of that's based on census and we have to subtract population for the Crescenta Valley Water District customers that live in the city of Glendale. And it comes out to about 60 gallons per person per day is our residential gallon per capita per day, which of course varies by month, but the variance is irrigation, basically. Um, at the last meeting, Commissioner Law, you had asked about the turf removal program. Um, so during MWD's sponsored turf removal program, the last program that was in place. Uh, our residents and businesses removed two point, almost 2.3 million square feet of turf for 52 acres. Um, and so that helped make some of the conservation permanent. And, and the estimated reductions about 300 acre feet a year or about 1% of our 2013 use. And we had 380 residential rebates and 25 commercial rebates. Excuse me, I have a question. We have regulation for turf watering. Uh, what about pool? Uh, is there any regulation, you know, how, how much evaporates uh, average and how, how many hours you can, you can run your pump? Is there any, because this is energy consumption, you know. Is there any regulation for those, those sorts of things? Currently on the pool, there isn't. Um, when we get into some of those more stringent phases, I want to say, you know, we got up to, um, I think, phase three when we were on the two-day two day week watering. 
when we go to that phase four and phase five, then there'll be restrictions on refilling your pool. But uh, we didn't reach that threshold in 2015. So in our, in our code, um, in the mandatory conservation, I think it's in the phase, I think it's in phase five, where there's restrictions on, on filling your pool. And that would be a very severe, I, I would imagine if we got to that, it would, might be because of a large earthquake and maybe one of the aqueducts or something like that broke and everyone in the region would just have to hold on to the water that we have in storage and wait maybe about six months till those got repaired. Would be my guess when there would be a restriction on something like that for a pool. Okay. In, in, in regards to running your pump, we all, like any other appliance, we ask that you do it in off-peak. So there is nothing that restricts you from running it, but but we ask that you do it maybe at night, you know, after eight or nine or even ten o'clock at night when you can run it, and that was when electricity is most available and cheapest for you as a consumer. Yeah, good point. And again, so with that, with the turf removal, and, and I know there's a, a lot of customers that maybe just let their lawns die and didn't get a turf removal program, but I, I think also um, everyone got used to watering less and it turned out maybe the plants are okay. Maybe there was a lot of cases of overwatering. So that's why we haven't rebounded just back to where we were in uh, 2012, 13, and 14. Uh, but, but definitely 2015, I think, was a tough year to go on that two days a week. So, so we did get a little bit of a rebound in 2016 when we went to three days a week. And again, so we're in that phase two. Uh, this one. Uh, Commissioner Abanessi, and yeah, in the phase five, it talks about and phase four, the use of potable water to clean, fill, or maintain levels in decorative exterior fountains is prohibited. Um, and, I, and I think there is there is something about the pools as well when we get in those later phases. But right now we're in phase two, and it's uh, three days a week, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and no more than 10 minutes it's per station. And then we've got on our website uh, a lot of water-saving tips and things you can look up about how to how to keep serving. Oh my God! Thank you so much. I really appreciate this information, and the only thing that can make it better would be if you could email it to me so I can look at it big. <laughs> it's just, yeah, yeah. It's just really helpful, um, very informative, and um, thank you very much. All right, you're welcome. Thanks. To everyone. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, ne next item, please. Boise Battery Storage Project. Uh, good evening, uh, Commissioners. Ramon Abueg, Chief Assistant General Manager for Electric and Power. So uh, I'm here today to give you an update on our battery energy storage system. As you're aware, there are assembly bills that are mandating that we have at least uh, a plan as to how much battery storage system we plan to accommodate by the year 2030. Uh, Senate Bill 886, as well as Assembly Bill 2514. Can I have the PowerPoint, please? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, so, oh, so what we're trying to do uh, with the program is we're trying to learn how we can best integrate the battery system into our electrical system and learn from it and see how we can do it. Currently, uh, well, the bill requires that we prepare a plan that, that is uh, viable and cost effective. So right now we think the technology is viable the cost-effective part is what we're trying to figure out. So based on the three ball or the balancing acts that we tried to do, we know that the battery system will provide us reliability and support our sustainability program. However, the affordability part is still a big question. So what have we done so far is uh, we now have a two megawatt, and we don't have it, but we're in the process of constructing a two megawatt battery system. And uh, so what it is, is we're going to install the storage system. It's right next to a Grand View substation. 
and that requires that we extend our 69 kV transmission line uh, to connect that directly to the Kellogg uh, switching station at the utility operation center. And uh, why at 69 and why at Kellogg? It's because we are going to use this to help us manage our interconnection with Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Uh, if you're familiar with our agreement with LA, we have what we call an inadvertency that we have to manage, which is plus or minus eight megawatts. And the reason for that is we do have uh, solar systems or PVs that are being installed within the city, and uh, those are intermittent <coughs> loads or intermittent sources that can go at any time. And the concern is when we plan the load for the day and the resources that we need, and those systems go out, it looks like our load would increase or resources would decrease. So we're going to try and use the battery to basically help us mitigate that, okay? So, so the battery system we are looking at, it's, it, it has one of the newer technologies. It would respond pretty quickly with the need and it will be programmed uh, at the intertie. So it would see all the resources coming in, it would see the generation that we have and it would see the load and try to help us manage how to, to mitigate again the in inadvertency. Uh, it will regulate the interconnection with LA as I pointed out. And the main thing about this to make, get us to the 2030 is the system that we're installing is scalable. The location where it is now is really temporary for us to learn from, but should should this work out and again becomes affordable, we can remove it or figure out a way to scale it up to, to a bigger battery system at, at its location or a different location. Um, it mitigates the you know, intermediacy. It's, 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 uh, and this is a big item for us too with the repowering and or the proposed repowering is uh, we need to come up with a, a backup system for the Unit 9. And should, should we go program with it and keep unit, unit 9 operating, the battery system can also provide what we call the backup generation we need so that we can black start Unit 9 in case we get, we need the unit and it got separated, we get separated from LA to allow us to fit our critical loads here in the city. Uh, and it's, uh, again, it's a completely new technology. We're learning a lot of the different ways of programming, or we will learn a different ways of programming it so, so that it would help us uh, really manage the interconnection. And so in terms of schedule, uh, we had the groundbreaking on November 16th, which Commissioner Lau uh, was able to participate in, and uh, immediately the day after, we started breaking ground. So it, it was, uh, and we anticipate that the project would be completely functional and operational by April uh, 2017. So uh, just to summarize, this is why we're looking at this project. Again, this is a small scale project, but scalable to a bigger scale. The main objective of this project is we, the staff, will learn how to integrate this in their system, learn how to program it, uh, then it's uh, once, if we go to and implement the repowering project, we, there's a plan or there's a um, provision for us to, a bigger, to install a bigger system. By then we would have learned a lot more than we need, a lot more and be able to use it more efficiently. And our goal, we're looking at 20 to 40 megawatts at some point. Again, if it becomes affordable, and there, there's a common misconception, I had to put this bullet at the bottom, that the battery alone is what we need. We still need to supply it with energy so it charges. So once you discharge it, if you're not connected to the grid and you don't have a generator um, recharging the battery, it would be uh, useless to us. So the battery supplements what we need. It helps us with, uh, again, smoothing out especially if you're familiar with the duck curve, that, that's becoming a bigger and bigger problem for us. So this would help us with that. So that's a quick summary of where we are with our battery system program. Any questions? Do you have any questions for Mr. Aboy? Uh, I have a question. 
you said this uh, battery system is a kind of backup to some of the lines that we have with LA. So when, when we lose some of these uh, lines, we can kind of back up that. So com comparing the capacity, what is the smallest capacity of the Los Angeles transmission line that it can yeah. compensate? No, it won't back up a transmission line. It's back. It's going to support the operation of the uh, photovoltaic, photovoltaics or the solar system. What it's managing, backing up, is how to manage the gap between our load and supply at the LA interconnection. So it's a very small scale, and it's just literally just going to help us smooth out what, what we're scheduling at that time point with LA. It's not backing up any transmission line. It's too small. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Can you, Mr. Oboig, put the, put the numbers into some context? So you mentioned this will be a 2-megawatt uh, test. You're looking in time to perhaps get up to 20 to 40 megawatts. You know, how, how much does that represent in, in terms of being able to you know, flatten out the dips and valleys when the... So, so what, what, what that would represent for us is uh, it enables us to invest more into renewable and help us firm it up. And as we get into more and more solar entering into our system that is installed by our customer or bigger uh, uh, solar systems, it would help us really smooth that out. Mm -hmm. So th that's what we're doing. So currently, we have about 7 megawatts of solar installed within Glendale. We anticipate that to go up to nearly 15 megawatts by end of next year. So when we're talking about 20, 40 megawatts, it's really going to be supporting that. So the 20 is perfect for the 17 megawatts that we're, or 15 megawatts we're anticipating. Okay. And then so when you, when you talk about, let's say, the system gets up to 20 megawatts after your initial test of two, mm -hmm. uh, with 20 megawatts, what is the period of time um, over which a, a battery storage system might be able to uh, perform? So depending on the design and the technology, but currently uh, what's out there would probably help us for about two hours. And then it requires at least six hours to recharge. Some of them may require 12 hours. It depends on how quickly we deplete it. If we deplete it within an hour, uh, it may require about 12 hours to charge. So just like the car batteries that, that you have now. Right. So... Mr. Ramon, um, I, I didn't understand. So this battery storage system is in one location. Correct. But your solar, our solar system that you say adds up to 17, uh, for example, uh, megawatt, there are scatters here and there. So uh, this battery, uh, you're going to charge it with the utility power. Correct. And if one of these solar system doesn't work, you're compensating here, that one? We're compensating at the interconnection with, with LA. So, so when, when you have a, a load with solar, we're not seeing that as a load. It's a zero gain, if you will, at that point. But as soon as they lose the solar, the load will go up, and the source coming in now has to be compensated for that loss. So we're trying to balance that is what we're trying to do. It, and it may be it's on a system basis, not an individual basis. So you take it out of the individual basis, put it more into the system, and that's where the, 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 uh, the, the will be addressed, attacked, I was going to say. That's where we'll attack the problem at the system, system um, level. Because th that is where our exposure is economically. Thanks. One more question for you. So I know there's a lot of hope around what battery storage can do. Um, and, uh, and so we're going through our own test here now in, in Glendale. Our, you, you mentioned that one of the key things that you and the staff look to be able to learn is how to integrate um, battery storage into, into the system. Correct. Are there others that have come before you where you can do some, some learning uh, f from others as you, as you design this system? Yes, uh, we have been in touch with other SCAFA members that have installed system and have asked them questions. In fact, we're using through our consultant, ask them questions how they have done it so we don't have to learn from the very beginning. So we're learning from their experience. Very good. Um, I, how is the project being delivered? Is this a contractor that's coming in and building it for us, or is this GWP staff that's actually putting it? Putting it's it? an uh, EPC uh, design build. Uh, it's the way it's, it's been uh, contracted out. 
And uh, what kind of battery technology is it? Lithium ion, lithium polymer, or? Uh, I think we're, I, I forgot what, we're, I, I remember the manufacturer, but I don't recall what technology we're using, but it's being provided by SAF, okay. S-A-F-T. Yeah, I would just caution that whoever we get uh, is putting in cells that are uh, of good quality. Uh, we believe that it, this is, we went through a vetting process through a consultant, and uh, they seem to be very um, well known worldwide in terms of battery systems. Okay, yeah. But there's a lot of stored potential energy in those, and they, you know, if they're, the cells are bad, they have a tendency to explode. Right. All things we were looking out for. So we have a good contractor. Um, this firm is, comes highly recommended. In, in even a, a burgeoning industry, but they have a lot of, of experiences, as Ramon mentioned, too, uh, overseas as well, that places that are sometimes ahead of us in some of these kind of technological advancements. So, Yeah, because we've good. had over a dozen battery manufacturers that met with me, and uh, none of them really have developed. They're, they're still in their R&D process. This is a true company that have been building battery systems. So, Okay. Very good. Any final questions? I just think this is fascinating, and I look forward to continued updates on the progress with construction and then when it's operational, um, exactly how it does play out in terms of integrating with the grid. So Correct. it's a great uh, project, and we're really, really curious to see how it comes, comes to bear fruit. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're very excited about this project. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Okay, Madam Clerk, next item, please. 4D. Water system master plan, capital plan, and funding plan. President Camargo, members of the commission, my name is Michael DeGhetto, Chief AGM for Water at Glendale Water and Power. And I'm going to give an update on our uh, Water Division 10 year CIP. So, the 10 year CIP is a recommendation of asset replacements and rehabilitation needs over the next 10 years. Um, I'll, I'll give a little bit of an overview of asset management versus what CIP is. I'm going to tie it into the master plan, um, do a high-level budget summary, break that down a little bit more by project category, and then talk a little bit about how, how to fund it. So asset management. Um, water utilities are a, a very asset-intensive organization. Um, and as part of the asset life cycle, you start with, uh, you do the construction, operate and maintain, you evaluate, rehabilitate, decommission, plan, design, and construct um, your assets to meet whatever those service needs are that you have. Um, and really, a lot of effort and a lot of what we talk about is on the shortest part of that whole cycle. It's the operate and maintain is the longest part, but it's just it only gets one bubble in the in the in the cycle um, to operate and maintain. If you have an asset that lasts 30 or 60 or 90 years, that's really the biggest part. But uh, all the engineering and, and planning and, and budgeting really go into that that smaller part up front. So so and the and the CIP is part of that. So the capital improvement programs, a set of projects that typically cost more than operations and maintenance work, and they're usually planned in advance. Uh, o and M works usually considered to be an expense instead of a capital expenditure, and capital items also have a longer life than an expense item typically. And then you can have overlap between maybe a large main break. If you installed a new section of pipe, you might capitalize that instead of expense it in O&M. And, and an analogy that I always uh, think about is, is your house and the roof on your house. You know, if you have a leak and you repair it, you'd expense that. But if you have to replace the whole roof, may, maybe you might even get a second on your mortgage and finance replacing the whole roof. So that'd be capital versus the expense part of it. So uh, the water master plan, we completed that at the end of 2015. And, and really what that is, the outcomes of that is we do an analysis of our current system. We project future needs based on, you know, we talk to the planning department, different zonings and things like that is coming up. We try and make projections on, on future needs. 
we really do a condition assessment of our assets and our facilities, um, which is really what drives the replacement needs and the re rehabilitation needs. Then we make recommendations on that. Um, and then we did a pr initial prioritization of near, mid, and long-term projects to give us a roadmap for our future work and our budgeting. Um, and that's the source document to make this 10-year master plan, so the, or the 10-year the capital improvement plan. Because the water system master plan um, spans 25 years, so it goes till 2040. So it takes a very long range look at all that. Uh, Mr. DeGhetto on that last slide, if you would, question. Yes. Um, so I imagine, when, I imagine when a system, a water system runs to fail, that that's more expensive than doing the, and inconvenient. Is it? Yeah, but that's definitely. an assumption. Is it more expensive uh, than, than uh, replacing it uh, prior to fail? Yeah, um, it, it's definitely less expensive to plan your replacements, to plan your shutdown, to plan uh, even to go out to bid and get good prices and things like that when you replace it. The other part of, the other part of it is maintaining your level of service. Mm -hmm. So whenever you have those unplanned outages, I mean, your level of service is terrible. Right. It affects a lot of people. Um, you have to do all your work on overtime, things like that. So it's definitely more expensive uh, to run to failure. Right. Uh, and I, when I, when I talk a little bit more about the financing part of it, you know, there's two sides to that. You, you definitely want to try not to replace an asset early either. You know, if you um, have an asset that has a 60-year life and you're depreciating it over time, just because you fully depreciated it, if it's still in great condition, you should still run it. You shouldn't replace it. Uh, so you, you try and strike a balance between those two things, and that's really where... Um, that uh, condition assessment comes in. You really try and assess the condition of the equipment um, to make that determination of when you need to replace it. Right. So, so can you talk further about how, how you do that? So I would think that so it kind of gets to the crux of my initial, initial question, which, you know, uh, run to fail, expensive, inconvenient. You also don't want to replace something or rehabilitate it, I guess primarily replace, uh, too early. That's mm -hmm. also then that's wasteful, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you then dial in exactly um, you know the the right time frame in which to uh, do this type of work for the facility items? So say a pump and a well a pump for example is you can do efficiency testing on the pump and you can see when the efficiency starts to drop off. You know that that pump's been wearing and you want to budget a replacement for that because even if that particular one isn't just failing. It's failing to the extent you're spending a lot more expenditure on energy to run that pump. So you want to plan that ahead and replace that or re rehabilitate it. On other facility projects uh, like a reservoir or a tank is we do routine inspections to look at the condition inside of the reservoir or tank. So on a tank, you can look at the coatings and see if the coatings are failing and then make a determination, okay, um, the coding looks like it's failing. Let's budget that and program that in for the next uh, rate cycle or the next budget year, you know, depending on the condition. Um, so you can plan it. And, and, and a lot of times what you'll do is you'll put it back into service. You use it because you need that reservoir. And then that way you can plan ahead and then replace it. The, the place where um, you do less of that specific analysis a lot of times is the pipelines. So on the pipelines, whenever we have a break or whenever we install a new pipeline, we'll keep coupons of the pipe and you just look at the condition of that pipe. So a lot of times we'll do relining projects because we'll know there'll be tuberculation inside the pipe, which is a, like a corrosion that happens inside of it. Um, but then we'll also look at the outside of the pipe. So if the outside of the pipe hasn't been corroding, then you know, oh, maybe relining makes sense because it's really the inside where the water's at, where we're having trouble. Whereas if you pulled something out in a certain area and the soil was very corrosive and you saw that, if your leak was because of what happened on the outside, you might say, all right, I need to replace that. Um, and as I get into the part on the piping, I'll, I'll show you a map. Okay, where we, very good. Where we organize some of that stuff. Thank you. So part of the 
master plan was just uh, like you had asked uh, President Camargo. You know, we will, as engineers, go look at all the assets, but then you then you add it all up to back into really the bottom line, right? So, um, in the blue line here, and we call it option one, that would be just do everything that we need to do, that we look at as engineers and make our determination, let's just go out and do all of it. Well, then, then you have to take some reality and think, okay, how's that gonna impact rates? Do you really need to do everything right now or can you get it to last a little bit longer? And that's where we come up with that, option two and three. And some of that is really, um, in our case, driven by decisions related to the pipelines, for the most part. And again, to, to show it in a table, in phase one, really between option two and three, there's not much difference, it's like five million a year. Uh, phase two, we start to see some divergence that I showed in that graph. Um, and then in phase three, there's a little bit more divergence. So the further out we go, uh, the more we have to spend every year to do our replacements. And then to, to sum it up, so part of the, part of what I, what I did to make this 10 year plan is to take information that we started on in 2015 and, and then overlay that into the next 10 years, if that makes sense. So, you know, 20, 2017, 2018 are already covered on our current rates and we're proposing to be about 7.3 million. Um, and again, the numbers I'm showing are, are really my cash flow. You know, maybe if I, uh, when we do our budgets, if we uh, do a budget for a project that is maybe 14 million, but over two years, we maybe have appropriated that 14. So sometimes when you see the annual budgets that we do citywide, those numbers might not be exactly what I'm showing here. These are, are what I'm showing as far as actually doing the work and, and spending. Um, so then I took 18 and 19 and up to 2023, 20, so which is basically all the phase one budgets, and then plus two years into the, the next two years, so I've got um, 25 million plus 20 million. And then I just divide by five years to get up to get to that nine million. So if we go back and look, we've got the fives and then and then basically um, two tens for that phase two in those next five years. And so that's 45 million divided by five is about nine million a year. Um, and then the final four years, I, I put that between the option two and three because um, I didn't want to, so it's like 10 and 14, what we're showing in the, in the phase two was between option two and three, and I thought a, a good 12 is splitting the difference so I don't build up so much towards the end till 2040. And a lot of times, too, um, setting your budgets, you know, it, again, it's really easy to go through and pick out every pump and every pipe and develop a budget, but sometimes it's good to have that to start at the top, too, so you can help prioritize in each year to fit within that amount. So then um, I broke it out by budget group to get a good idea of where we're spending that money, you know, where, where we're doing the work. And I've got pipelines, facilities, and plants, and then what I call annual programs. And then I'll go over in the presentation each of those, those categories. But essentially, a little more than half of what we're gonna spend is on pipelines. So, and the reason for that is we have 380 miles of pipelines. Uh, they vary by size, material type, year of installation and current condition. And again, a lot of that, the current condition we know from when we go out and fix leaks or, or even uh, if we added a new service and we had to cut in a T or something like that, we can see what the pipe's like. Um, so our upgrades are needed due to the age, condition, to address some service level issues like improving fire flow in certain areas during high demand periods and, and if there's a fire to and to provide redundancy. Um, and that, that information we'll get from our hydraulic model. So that's another tool we'll use to look at or to assess um, the infrastructure. Is we can run the hydraulic models, show 
in a high demand period, what if there's a fire right here or a fire hydrant's on? And then we'll note that there's high velocities, let's say, in a certain piping that feeds that area. And that'll help us determine, hey, that's an area where we need to upsize the piping. Um, so this is the part where, uh, where I was talking about between the, the three options, how quickly we spend and do the replacements. And we broke it out into, we've got about 30 miles of four inch pipe. And we basically don't install four inch pipe anymore. Probably the smallest we'll install is eight inch. Um, we've got 18 miles of six inch that was installed between before 1945. And we've got 66 miles of six inch that was installed between 1945 and 1970. Um, and some of that's been relined. And of course it's newer, so we've moved those out further in that timing of our replacement program. Um, let's see. Is it necessarily true that the older pipes are um, by definition in poor condition, or are there also sort of eras when pipe installation was maybe not to the standard that we would want now? You know, that's, um, that's a good question. So a lot of our pipe, the majority of our pipe is cast iron pipe. The issue with the cast iron pipe, when it was installed, it, it was unlined. And that's where we get that corrosion on the inside, that tuberculation. So the soils here in, the, in Glendale, for the most part, are not very corrosive. So the outside of those pipes has been in pretty good condition. So what we've been able to do is these lining projects where um, we use machinery to basically get that tuberculation out, and then another machine goes in and lines it with concrete. And that concrete bonds to the inside of it. So it gives you, basically it re truly rehabilitates it and gives it like an, an extension on its life which gets back a little bit to when I was talking about capitalizing. If you extend the life of the asset, that's also something you would capitalize. So um, so it's not necessarily true that because it's older, it's worse. The piping that is definitely worse is a lot of those four inch would be steel. So they're very thin walled steel mains that might have been coated with um, like a coal tar epoxy. And those have definitely corroded, and they get pinholes, and they leak all the time. So those might be maybe older material that is definitely not as good as the new material. Now, one thing about the new material when we do replace it is we'll use ductile iron pipe. And ductile iron, um, basically, what, like the name implies, has more ductility. It could um, take more loading without cracking and just splitting like a cast iron could. So it is a better material that we're putting in now than that other material. So uh, I guess what, what I'm getting at is definitely what we're putting in now is better, but a lot of what we have isn't bad either. That makes sense, all right. And then, and then this, this I, I just want to show it. So it, it gives a visual idea of how, how many mains we have to replace. So all the red is, that, is the four-inch pipelines. Um, and the orange is that six-inch pipeline uh, before 1945. And then the yellows are the six-inch that was between 45 and 70. And then... Um, the brown is replacing 16th pipeline that was relined after 1970. So that pipeline we're going to replace mainly, be, mainly to, with 8 inch to get better flow and better fire flow in those areas. And that'll, those will be later, later on. The, the, next, the next 10 year capital plan. Um, so, and in, in here, here are basically the projects. We're going to have our pipeline management program, which are those replacements. We have fire flow improvements, and we have some capacity improvements. Um, and in the master plan, there's, there's two more maps, the fire flow and the capacity. And maybe on the capacity, it might just be a short section of main where we don't have a main right now. And it, it's what we call loop. Like, we might loop two streets or loop the system, and that'll really help the flow in that area. 
um, and capacity improvements, again, would be those ones, maybe they're four inch or six inch, and we want to make them bigger just to have better capacity in those areas. And, and it's, uh, you know, one, one thing to think about, all, of us, all the facilities, all the pipelines at some point are going to have to be replaced. And everything that we replaced is going to have to be replaced again at some point in the future. That's part of that asset light cycle. So, you know, these pipeline management program, you know, if we budget 2.3 million and then uh, whatever, that year get very high bids or something, we'll do fewer feet knowing that we have that those feet we didn't do for the next year. You know, we're just always going to have to keep churning through the pipeline replacements. Uh, so for the facilities and plants, um, and again, it's potable and recycled. We've got 22 pressure zones, 32 reservoirs and tanks, 31 pump stations, 72 pumps and motors, 16 wells, six interconnections with other agencies, three pressure re regulating stations, two treatment plants, five chemical facilities, two turbine generators. We have six dams. Some of our reservoirs are dams. They're considered to be dams. And then plus, and I throw in there the SCADA system, you know, because that's, um, so there's the software for the SCADA, which is the supervisory control and data acquisition system. There's the programming of that software. There's the licensing and upgrades of the software. But really related to that, everyone, almost every one of those facilities, then there's a programmable logic controller that has its own software and its own programming. And then there's all the sensors that measure pressure and flow and um, chlorine residual levels and things like that, that all, that I would lump under that SCADA system as well. So there's just a lot of assets and equipment related to that. So at the facility and plants, we have, we have more individual projects lined item out that we know from the master plan. Uh, and say portable power backup program, at a lot of those plants, we have connections where we can bring a generator, a portable generator, and hook it up to the plant and run the plant if there's a long-term power outage. So we're going to do a few more upgrades at some plants to have that. Um, so we've got uh, Chevy Chase 1666 tank. That's a project in the master plan we looked at where we have some concern about the amount of fire flow protection we have there. And it's, it's a very small pressure zone where um, it's hard to get enough turnover in the tank to keep the water new. But we need the water for the fire flow, so we're going to look at taking that tank out and putting variable frequency drives on the pumps and maybe have an engine-driven pump so we can meet fire flow demands and supply that zone without having that water quality issue with, the, with that tank. Um, and anyway, and then there's just other tanks like that and some other projects. Again, line item out uh, by the different plants. So then the annual uh, re repair and rehabilitation or replacement and rehabilitation projects. Um, that, this one spans all the asset categories, but, but they're really these capital budgets that we need just to do our everyday stuff. Um, so... The reason it's capital is because if we go replace a valve out in a street, it might cost us ten, fifteen thousand dollars. So that gets it up to that capital asset threshold. Um, and some examples would be we have thirty-four thousand service lines. So every customer has a service line. Um, we've got nine thousand valves, thirty-one hundred fire hydrants, and, and just other things like that that end up being capitalized, but they're really small projects. And then we've got like those the tank, you know that particular tank we're getting ready to recode it in that picture. And you know one thing we do now is we'll put stairs on the outside instead of ladders. Um, we'll do the coating on the inside and outside. And it, underneath that scaffolding, there's some piping there, and that's that's piping that actually flex, can flex and move if there's an earthquake and that tank slides off its foundation. That piping will flex and move, so we don't pull the piping off the side of the tank and lose all the water that's in it. So those, these are just smaller budgets, and there's a lot more of them. Um, and again, it's even hard to show it as millions like I had in the other, the other categories. Um, but the hydrant replacement program, we're going we're gonna to look um, 
at starting our meter and endpoint replacement program. So I think 2012 is when they first got installed. Typically a meter, a water meter will have a 15 year lifespan as well as the battery for the endpoints. Ideally, if it's a 15 year lifespan, you would do 1 15th of all of them every year to have a manageable budget. So we're looking at maybe starting at year 10 and then working our way into getting into that 1 15th of a program. So a little bit later on past this 10 years that 350,000 might drop down to 250. And we'll just have a constant program of doing 1 15th of all the meters and endpoints every year. Um, things like doing uh, landscaping upgrades. You know, we, we basically turned off all the irrigation last year at all of our sites. And we're gonna go back and we're gonna start installing some drought tolerant landscaping and things like that at some of the sites. And doing some upgrades there. Um, as far as implementing, so there's a couple of parts to that. You know, one, one is, you know, really, really getting approval on on this from the council, um, and doing our cost of service analysis. So having the ten-year plan, those first five years will feed into there'll be an input to our cost of service analysis for the next rates. We got to make sure we have the right staffing um, available to increase the program and and have and and deliver the projects. Um, and President Camargo, this gets in a little bit to that risk tolerance. You know, these are some policy decisions related to the level of service, how many unplanned outages are we, can we live with, um, controlling future costs. You know, the longer we delay those replacements, the more it's going to cost to replace things later. Um, again, policy and rates, and then and then how we how we fund it, and some of the rate implications would be pay as you go, which means. Um, we'd have to have that $9 million I'm proposing collected every year from customer rates. If we did bonds, um, we'd only have to uh, collect for the debt service. So, so it, it, it reduces your rate impact right now if you do funding that way. Um, one thing that we want to propose is, I call it a future generations charge. Just, just break it out on the bill and just show it. You know, here is your capital charge for maintaining the system over time. Um, and again, all that's going to be part of our upcoming cost of service analysis. My ending slide, if you got any questions. Questions? Hearing none, thank you. Uh, next agenda item, please. Five oral communications. Discussion is limited to items not part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. Commission may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision. The general manager may refer the matter to the appropriate staff for investigation and report. Thank you. I have no cards here at, the, at, at my station. Do you have any there? I do not. Okay. Uh, next item, please. Six, agenda forecast. Okay, thank you. So picking up on uh, one, of, one of the discussions today about battery storage, I think, the, uh, I think with Mr. Abueg, we talked you talked about that uh, uh, system being built um, going into construction now and I think being available uh, starting in, um, uh, what, first quarter of next year, it's March or so? April. April of next year. So, so I would ask, is there an appropriate time at which we might revisit uh, battery storage and at, at a time where maybe you start to understand, you know, how, is, how, how are you doing against your key objective is learning how to integrate that system into the, into the grid? Probably close to a year from now. I would say next fall we would probably have some more definitive data. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, you'll just let us know when it's up and running, right? Well, my my objective, uh, Commissioner Law, was to have you all come down again, and, and we'd cut the ribbon and then get a chance maybe to take you next door and show you Grandview, too, because we're really proud of that. We haven't had that chance. But short of that, we will absolutely keep it, Great. keep it, the updates coming. Okay. 
So, so maybe fall of next year. Um, the other thing I recall from last conversation, uh, last meeting, was that we, uh, while I see that uh, we have no meeting planned for uh, January because it, it uh, falls on a holiday, um, we did talk, I think uh, Commissioner Hale talked about the potential to have a special meeting uh, given the timing of uh, agenda setting for legislation. Yeah, uh, the ledge, the bill introduction deadline is the end of January. So, uh, particularly if staff or the city council want to make recommendations about bills that we would like for our assembly member or some assembly member or senator to introduce, um, January would be the appropriate meeting to have that. We discussion. we don't have anything planned at this point in our um, California Municipal Utilities Association legislative day in Sacramento is the 29th of January, which is when we usually have the best idea of what's going on. Um, even if there's, there's nothing, like I said, that short of what we might uh, put together as a SCAPA group or as a SCAPA NCPA group or as CMUA as a whole, uh, which there doesn't appear to be anything definitive on that agenda. It usually is good when we go up and do our day or two days in Sacramento and then come back, and that would be in enough time to get it on that sixth meeting in February and give you at least the state update. We don't go to Washington until end of middle of February. I think we go second or third week of February, so we'll come back in March if there's anything on the federal level that's, that's pressing and give you an update on, on that. So we don't have a legislative update in scheduled in March because it's not our regular rotation, but certainly we'll make it one if, in fact, uh, on the federal level there's anything that, that's outstanding. And as you know, that may be the more exciting part of this, this whole topic because there could be a lot of legislation on the federal level, maybe not necessarily the direction a lot of people would like to see. Could be a lot of undoing of things that have already been done, but we'll see. Uh, I think we'll have a good idea then from legislators on where they're going with regards to clean energy versus not so clean energy, coal and things like that. Um, we are insulated to a great degree here in California because our laws are supersede those that are, that are at or above what the, the federal uh, government does. But there could be some interesting things that impact us, especially, you know, when you're talking about solar incentives and things like that that have been threatened. So. Yeah, so I, I would suggest um, we have an email blast to the commissioners Absolutely. with um, maybe SCAPA priorities or any any kind of We'll ideas. send that out to you, uh, and I think that in, in the event anything happens, we'll send you a note and say maybe it would be a good idea if there was something that we needed support on. Uh, there's nothing on that front at this point, but that could change. So, yeah, we'll definitely keep you minimum email uh, updated, and then on that uh, – February 6th meeting, we'll, we'll just tentatively put a legislative, a federal legislative update. Very good. Like I said, there could be a lot of fireworks there. Could be entertaining. Uh, state, too, I would suggest. Just I'm going to do the state on the uh, February. Oh, I see, on March. Yeah, I, uh, okay. I'll, we will have made our junket up to uh, Sacramento and talked to the legislators, so I can give you that one uh, even earlier. Got it. So, And then the, the feds were going a little bit later in, in that. Month, so I'll give that up to you on, on March. Other thoughts regarding the agenda forecast? Other suggestions? Uh, there was a question that was raised, Commissioner Law did um, last meeting, was about uh, energy efficiency as it relates to building uh, codes. Um, and so Christine was going to look at that just from a perspective of, I think you just wanted an update because we just hmm. had to be careful about crossing over to other commissions, jurisdictions and things. Um, but I don't think, and I'll have to double check with her and, and Doreen, but I don't think it would it, it would hurt it to have maybe the building official come and just tell you what, what water and electric conservation measures are embedded in their current codes and if they're planning anything. I think the new code just got adopted, so there may be something more in there. Um, you'd also ask some information about counts and housing counts, and I'm not sure to what degree that CDD keeps those, but we'll check on that. But I think at a minimum we could have the building official come and give you an overview on what the building codes have currently or what may be planned in regards to conservation, both electric and water. And how that affects consumption, yeah. 
Well, it's hard to say how that affects consumption. I think you saw today, as I had well, indicated that, before, yeah. is personal, mm -hmm. personal is, is the, the focused effort by us, not, not to mention, I won't, you know, it, it, it is the outreach, it is the statewide uh, initiative, it is the mandatory conservation. All those things combined, as, as, you, as you can see from Mike's uh, report, resulted in some very, very positive uh, production. Uh, or, or reduction in usage, I should say, from our, our residents. Even to the point of backing off on the mandatory, we're still seeing a very substantial, almost 20 percent uh, reduction in usage. So those are really good things. So to the best of our ability to be able to do that and what that relates to. But again, you, Mike showed you that data where we had you know an increase of 1.9 percent in in housing residential units, however you define those, and an 18 percent decrease in usage. For the same period, so uh, you know, things are looking good. But I yeah, think that was just the kind of information I was curious about. It was really yeah. Helpful. And we can keep that'll that'll continue to be part of our updates to mm -hmm. you in our in our drought uh, conservation updates that we give you. So, but if you're still interested, we can have the building official come and give you an overview. If that's something you'd like. The other commissioners are seeing nodding heads. Yes, yep. we'll do that. Yes, then. please do. Probably it looks like that March meeting maybe have a little bit more capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, from a time standpoint. So I'll talk to um, to Miss Edwards and see if we can't do that. Thank you. Very good. Anything else? Commissioner Law. Oops. OK, uh, very good. So that takes care of the agenda forecast. Next item, please. Seven, adjournment. A motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Any, any objection? Okay, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you so much.